welcome everybody. Um, we're going to wait for everyone to come into the room and we will be starting in just a few minutes. Okay, I'm just going to get us started. Um, thank you so much for attending today's webinar. Uh, my name is Brittany Vandorf, and I'm the Outreach and um, Communication Specialist for New Mexico EPSCoR, uh, which is the established program to simulate competitive research. It's a nationwide program funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, I will be your host today, along with Isis Serna, our website administrator, who will be working behind the scenes to make it all flow smoothly. A few housekeeping items before we begin. I want to let you know that if you have questions at any point, uh, just type them into the Q&A box and ISIS will interrupt Mr. or Dr. Nadimi and read them out loud. Um, I also want to let you know about the last webinar in our spring webinar series, which is on May 26th. It's Opal RT for Beginners, led by New Mexico Smart Grid Center graduate student and research assistant, Rusty Nail. Uh, he's working with Olga Lavrova down at NMSU. Um, registration info can be found in this month's newsletter and on our website. Okay, and now um, I'd like to introduce our presenter for the day, which we are super excited about. Um, it's Dr. Hamid Nadimi, who joined the New Mexico Smart Grid Center team working at NMSU last year. He earned a PhD in electrical engineering and power electronics in 2014, and has experience in the private sector as a senior research scientist at ABB. More recently, in the academic sector as a research scientist at RPI, and where, where he led industry-sponsored projects focusing on renewable energy resources, autonomous digital power grids, and transportation electrification. Dr. Nick Dimi's research and teaching interests include power electronic applications in microgrids, electric vehicle charging stations, motor drives, and advanced control methods. Dr. Nadimi, thank you for being with us today. We are so jazzed. Take it away. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Brittany, for your kind introduction. And also, I have to appreciate and to be thankful to uh, New Mexico Smart Grid Center for inviting me first and then giving this opportunity to share my thought about what I have learned in industry and in academia for now a few years. Uh, I'm going to yeah I'm going to share my slide with you, and then also I turn off my video, and then later I'll back. Can you see my slide now? Yes. Perfect. So uh, hello everyone. Uh, as you know that the title is kind of uh, development or control development, and also the interoperability challenges and open gaps in uh, new energy. Uh, systems and also uh, not only the new energy from the power grid side from the electrified transportation and e-mobility systems as well so the key topics i, I focus is to just uh, explain to you um, the open gaps and challenges related to the both transportation and also the the energy and power and energy area based on my um, a few experiences happened in, in like a wind systems pv electric vehicle charging station and so on and then uh, try to uh, outline the the what i would see in the future in terms of the research framework and approach uh, and then includes that includes also the how uh, do we teach 
uh, to be as part of uh, the as an educator in academia or what would be the, the key mission of the universities and educational institutes to for workforce development for example to uh, address those kind of challenges with respect to the uh, future engineers or technologies and then i share some of my my research work to address some of those challenges obviously uh, laboratory uh, work uh, and uh, experimental works and also some uh, sample research projects to get some flavor of what i was uh, uh, trying to to explain to you uh, in the the first two bullets and then the future ambitions with respect to the both research and also the, the course curriculums, what would be the, what are the skills in demand from the industry point of view for the future workforces, which are obviously our uh, students, uh, and uh, also uh, from the, the, the other side, what are the, 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 the key uh, intention or what would be the, the goal for the people in academia uh, to integrate those kind of challenges or research challenges into the course curriculums and so on. So uh, <clears throat> I'm sure most of you have heard the name of a smart grid concept. Now is the, the, the technology, uh, basically the, the integration of two electrical and infrastructure uh, and information infrastructures uh, securely, we call it a smart grid systems, right? So uh, when, when it comes to the a smart grid control system usually we need to have the the good observability and the awareness about the the dynamics control over the energy resources could be different types of energies showing the completely different characteristics um, like wind pv battery energy storage fuel cell flywheel and also how we can integrate those uh, new uh, distributed energy resources to the what are what we have as an existing and available uh, electrical uh, infrastructures and utility grids as well so <clears throat> having said that there are a couple of uh, key uh, the, the the revolutionary items the first of all it seems that we we are transitioning and moving towards a sustainable electronic energy network yeah, that's the sustainable electronic energy networks. And then later on, I would uh, explain to you what I mean by electronic energy networks. So obviously the microgrid or smart grid systems uh, differ from the traditional grids, uh, mostly because uh, the, the, the prox pro providing the proximity between the power generation and also the consumers or, or the power uh, use components. The smart network, uh, the smart term of the smart grid systems mainly refers to the uh, to have a smart network we need the wireless communication systems why the reason is that for energy management and also the the load side demand estimation which is quite uh, interesting and, and required to achieve this bi-directional power flow so as part of the integration of the, a lot of distributed energy systems uh, drs uh, the same for the transportation systems. We are moving from the uh, inner functionality to the interactions. Interactions is mostly uh, bi-directional power and energy flow and in, uh, interaction between the different systems. And therefore, uh, we need to have the communication and then energy management, how to, uh, as I said, that get uh, um, good observability among the multiple resources uh, for the large scale system, even it's, it's more uh, complicated. And also the, the autonomous operation, uh, which includes also the, the advanced automation systems, because it seems that the control is kind of uh, enabling technologies, but here I'm focused on the uh, more interactions between the power electronics as an enabling technology and the control uh, domain, advanced control systems to tackle some of the existing open gaps in industry in and also obviously that's the, the the way university should collaborate and they get partnership with the industry private sector power industries to tackle uh, to address those uh, solutions so therefore as you will see for example in this picture from the generation side we more and more rely on the power electronics right the the tremendous number of a huge number of power electronic converters 
should be provided the, the, the renewable resources. That's kind of grid forming uh, technologies. And then from the load side or demand response, the more electricity produced by power electronics is supplied or consumed by electronic sources. So it's all about the electronics. That's why we call it integration or integrated a grid as well. So uh, this kind of uh, new uh, features characterize the, the different uh, the, the design, the different uh, the, the research works to be done uh, compared to what has been used, for example, in even in last decade or last two decades. So uh, as I said that, uh, how we can manage the, the whole grid uh, with the huge number of power electronics converters, because come, uh, in, unlike the existing or traditional power systems, uh, which are heavily rely on high inertia component like uh, electric machines, in particular synchronous generators. Now the power electronics based enabling the future grids. So that would be, and also there would be the huge number of heterogeneous and also non-synchronous players. So you see uh, in this picture, for example, the, the v, at least the industry or V uh, based on the last decade experience in the field, we learned that the, the, the response, for example, from the wind farms, regardless whether that's land-based wind, up plant or offshore wind, the solar systems, they, they all have some uh, different characteristics, uh, either the steady state and also in particular the transient response. And then uh, the, the root cause analysis report for a couple of incident happened uh, different continent different area of the the world in last five six years uh, at least i have uh, experienced the, the wind farm the solar uh, power outage that happened for those uh, wind and also the, the larger scale solar systems was something related to the control protection and then leading to the unstable situation so for these future systems how does the, the this this trend or this integration uh, challenge is going on with the really uh, high pace uh, can can challenge the stability uh, analysis and then what would be the the tools we need uh, to to develop to to analyze and assess the the stability margin and limits for the whole system from the age uh, like the local stability for each single of these distributed energy resources and then uh, when you integrate as a whole and then we call it the system what uh, the, the the leverage or tool we need to develop to precisely uh, observe the stability margins uh, to to avoid the, uh, the, the, the whole system uh, pushing towards the uh, instability and then the, the requirement for that one the requirement means that the requirement for solar is completely different from the wind so the standardization in general is, is one of the, the, the key point. And that's why we need to move forward from the, uh, the sub-component or uh, equipment design towards the, the more system problem, because this is the more system problem, system engineering, and not even the system engineering, the system integration challenges. So the good solutions therefore uh, demand for the, the whole system thinking. So it means that we need to design the system hands in hand with the, uh, the, the equipment or component designs. So for the power electronics, usually, so before that, the, the reasonable research framework on approach and also the teaching style also is that definitely the electrical energy faces the, the huge challenges but for us to be in academia is that there are big opportunities actually so to do the more and more r and d's what is so called the the experiment uh, exponential technologies are actually and uh, encompasses the, the pv systems for example the wind the batteries the information technologies the communications and then the power electronics storage devices and analytics so today uh, i more rely on the the power electronics rule and then the energy storage what uh, and then how we can uh, take advantage of data analytics artificial intelligence techniques because we need uh, those kind of solutions this system as a system is kind of multidisciplinary 
uh, with the huge interactions. So it's not just one single or, or two domains, that's the interdisciplinary uh, challenge. And then we have seen the, the some uh, negative impact or disruptive impact would be from the all from the operations, planning, regulatory agencies, and then the stability, resiliency, and then the cost, right? If we, if all the, the countries, states set the target to achieve, for example, this amount of uh, green energy, the, the produce power from the renewable based generation by 2030, 2035, or 100 based renewable energy systems by 2040 or 2050. Therefore, we need to also uh, to be the, the technologies itself should be more comparable with the, the existing one. We have to compete the, the fuel uh, or coal fired uh, power generation in terms of cost, for example, or the size volume. Uh, so I would also more emphasize here on the stability, uh, for example, and also the, the operation uh, disruptions aspect uh, by, by this uh, huge integration of the, the new distributed energy resources. So, uh, so far we have made really good advancement or progress in, in uh, manufacturing. For example, for power electronics, white band gap semiconductor power electronics, we have made tremendous progress. Uh, the, the 3D manufacturing, additive manufacturing are helping this, these capabilities are helping to achieve uh, our goal. However, in terms of the control automation, and also the integration theories, there are lags. So uh, at both control system design and also the how to integrate those kind of systems showing it completely different uh, characteristics from the system point of view. For example, the, the graph uh, or the picture you will see on the right side, that's the, the, the real time measurement based on the wind land-based wind farms uh, in in a state of the is the state of Oklahoma. So uh, in I believe in 2015 uh, there was a power outage, huge power outage in the based uh, for the Oklahoma wind farm, uh, and mainly it was the you see uh, during the the incident. Uh, this is just the one time period or time interval for a couple of seconds uh, for the data of the, 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 the voltages. And then you will see the uh, red graph shows the what the SCADA, the existing SCADA system, supervisory control data acquisition system in, in that wind farm detected. And then you will see the, for example, uh, based on the uh, phaser measurement unit, uh, synchro phasers, for example, when we plot it afterwards and then uh, capture, to, to, to uh, overlap this um, SCADA measurement and data acquisition system with the phaser measurement units uh, showing by, by the blue uh, graph or curve, then you will see how bad the existing data acquisition system could, could detect the magnitude, for example, of the disruptions or changes could be the, the frequency harmonies, could be the, the disruption or disturbances on the like voltages and so on. And then because of this, the protection system, for example, detected uh, some uh, over voltage, under voltage, over frequency or under frequency in this wind farm, and then uh, try to shut down the entire uh, power production. So this is the, the, the real uh, challenge because the, the wind farm, wind turbine, usually arranged in the cluster of several clusters of wind uh, turbine, uh, like five, six wind uh, clusters, and each cluster includes the 10, 20 uh, individual wind turbine. Then the, the wind shows the very fast uh, reactions. Uh, because the, the fast reactions or dynamics, in, it could be because that's the periodic renewable energies, right? And then, uh, especially for the large scale wind, the emerging oscillations, either it could be in, in, in the form of harmonics or in the form of uh, what we call uh, resonance harmonics. And then in terms of the operational risk, obviously the wind turbine shows almost zero inertia. And then when you compare with the traditional synchronous generator, that that's really uh, significant. And then we, we need to have the coordinated disconnections schemes. 
to, to be also uh, in line with that time scale we are talking about. And then to detect those oscillations or harmonics, for example, to avoid the power outage. So these are the, the key challenges. Another example, for example, if I tell you uh, for the large scale solar uh, power plants uh, in August 2016 in Southern California, there was uh, the, as a result of fault, uh, there, there was a 1200 megawatt power outage. That's a significant power outage. The, the initial reason was because of the ground fault over voltages happened due to the faults, right? And then the, the, in the beginning, the thought was the protection system wrongly perceived the under frequency conditions for these uh, uh, solar systems. And then uh, resulting the, the some uh, impose some disturbances, distortions into the voltage waveform and then caused by, by, for example, fault transient and then the protection system shut down the 1200 megawatts. However, for this, uh, and afterwards, the almost it took 10 months or almost one year, the root cause analysis report released and then you can later look at the reference I put at the on, uh, bottom of this slide. Uh, in June 2017, uh, first of all, the PV manufacturers deployed in that uh, plant were programmed to seize the output only because of the under frequency if the frequency goes down uh, below 57 hertz, right? However, when the, uh, the Western Electricity Coordinating Council WECC released the root cause analysis, they discovered that the, no, the frequency dropped to just 59.86 hertz for this event. So, you know, that that's because of the, the, the in, in 2015-16, for the PV manufacturers, the design for the control for the protection system was based on the, the small scale or based on the, what is so-called the traditional uh, positive, negative, zero sequence, um, the, the, the component to be incorporated into the, the protection scheme, the design protection scheme for the inverters. And later on afterwards, uh, each state like New York, California, Hawaii, and some other countries also, uh, it is the same thing happened, for example, in Australia with the same root cause analysis. And then there was a huge R&D budget to do the more R&Ds. And like two years ago, two and a half years ago, one of the widely used IEEE standards, 1547, um, received a huge or major revision to just include this kind of uh, recommendations or guidelines for PV manufacturers. So we are learning still, but still the, the standardization is, is one of the key challenges, obviously requires a lot of R&D before providing any recommendations. So the reason is that for these renewable energy systems due to the fast dynamics and, and the response, it's very hard to estimate the frequency by just measuring the voltage and currents. Because as I said that, what happened in the, the, the incident happened in the wind in Oklahoma was basically lack of or poor uh, data acquisition system based on the, the SCADA technology deployed in that plant. So uh, that's still the challenge. The estimation of the frequency uh, changes is a still challenge. And later you will see uh, those challenges, especially for the, the, the transients, usually introduce or impose some uh, harmonics and then uh, transferred or transformed in the sense of the, the resonances. And then to keep track of this large bandwidth of the, the harmonic spectrum for the control system, that, that's really a challenge. That's why we need to take lots of measurements. Therefore, the, the measurement device or equipment should be more capable and also how to process so fast those measurements to send the, the appropriate signal to the control and protection system, monitoring system, for example. So, Another uh, actually a good thing uh, drives the industry and academia in particular in the last uh, few years to go more and more on real-time model development, real-time testing before even uh, developing the prototype, lab scale, and then do the more detailed analysis is that um, the, there was a meeting uh, between the, the regulators, utilities, agencies with the uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission 
nearly three years ago in April 2018. And then it was the, the highlights on the news that they really demand a strongly need for uh, real-time models to better manage the distributed energy resources. Because as I said that due to those incidents, the, the worst thing happened is that uh, to not have the good visibility or awareness for the system and also for the operators about the what's down on each uh, the situation uh, at the edge side of each distributed energy resources. And then uh, the, to get the no the, the dynamics of the system, therefore, uh, we, we need to have the real time uh, data or real time information to do the proper uh, action accordingly uh, within the sh short uh, or very fast time we have to avoid uh, power disruption or to avoid or preventing cascading uh, connection of the failures or faults. So. Uh, that that's good thing for us to do the more and more r and d's and then the, the for engineering uh, students because it seems that uh, the, there is a huge demand for the industry sector private sector to uh, to recruit the the future workforces uh, those who already gain this kind of information at least into some level to be able to deal with to analyze to simulate to model to understand and comprehend the the new energy and uh, transportation systems. So the, the after all, so the it is turned out that the learning should be actually based on the, the real time test bed development. So this has been the, the new norm for a few years for education sector as well to fulfill the industry um, expectations of the new engineers and also the, the technologies. So the technologies, I would emphasize that because uh, even for the future workforces, uh, they of course they should have the technical knowledge about the domain, but how to um, make a best use of those technical knowledge with respect to the, the emerging technologies and then the management skill it is uh, another uh, challenge for the future workforces to get to know the, the management skills in addition to the just the technical uh, the uh, content of, of the each domain, if it's power, it's information technology, data analytics, or some other communication or some other domains. So, uh, for example, uh, what I have uh, seen personally when I was working in upstate New York, for example, the, the NIPA, New York Power Authority, uh, I think two years ago, three years ago, they established uh, what is so-called the Agile system, the New York Advanced Grid Innovation Lab for Energy. And then you will see they put a lot of real-time uh, simulators from the RTDS, from the Opal RT, from the Typhoon or larger scale, small scale uh, real-time simulators to be able to simulate the, the uh, mainly the transient operations of the uh, the new energy and transportation systems in a real time manner means that very close to uh, the, their physical counterpart as much as we can. And then in this way, we can generate much more data sets, the, the measurements, and then we can develop some like control algorithm based on the, the real time measurement. And then by incorporating the, the, uh, the field measurements and learning, then at least we can achieve the, some optimal. Uh, solutions in wide variety aspects in different domains to, to achieve the uh, smart grid system to work in reliable and uh, to achieve the resiliency as well. And so that, that's uh, already uh, been deployed in the, uh, the, the state, federal, and also the, the private sectors. So universities also is getting used or, or getting used to uh, deployed more and more these real-time simulators in their research, and also it could be incorporated easily into the, the, the lab courses, lab component, and also the course curriculums, because these are the, the first step for the students to first understand the, the different systems, uh, different aspects of the, the systems in terms of the analysis, synthesis, and then the, the, the validation uh, domains. So uh, what I here outlined is that uh, we are the requirement, we, we have two requirements from the most left and right side. One is the modernization and then how we can 
incorporate those new technologies into the uh, existing assets, infrastructure, we have electrical infrastructure and utility grids, right? And then the other thing is that we have to reimagine the future of the uh, those uh, fast moving technologies, as I explained, power electronics is one of them, communication, IT, analytics, um, storage uh, technologies. And then uh, it, it, the, the good thing is that in collaboration with industry, universities and industries, they know now the open challenges and the existing gaps. So therefore we need to even develop some tools, some models uh, to, to, to be able to update and with the facility uh, capability to, to reuse them for uh, multiple applications. And then for each specific systems, we need to have the design basis, obviously. So to pr prove that one, we need to look at the, the performance as a whole system and then the reliability of the service. That's the, the, the key items should be uh, taken into account. Uh, when we are in the design phase processes and the implementation. And then we need to move forward with the real-time simulation and implementation to get better understanding about the, for example, the controller, when the controller, controller integrated into the real-time model to perform how this dynamics uh, can change and then what uh, the, the controller can respond appropriately. And then that's the closed loop system. Then the the testing of technical solution should actually uh, refine and update our design bases, the tools and the models. And then in this way, we can achieve the best, for example, uh, PV model uh, to, to, um, to be able to test the PV, to simulate the PV system in a steady state, in large scale, a small scale, in grid forming, grid following uh, operating points, and so on. So, Based on the, what I explained when I was working at, at ABB in Europe um, the, in 2018, in summer, ABB announced the, one of the fast EV chargers called the Terra 53CJ. Uh, it was mainly designed for uh, operating like 350 kilowatt um, to, to be sufficient uh, for the distance, driving distance of 125 miles range. And then the, the charging time should be just uh, eight minutes, right? And then uh, the, this technology or charging station intended to be used in the highway, rest stop, or petrol station, something like that. And also for, as you see, not only for the, the, the medium or uh, lightweight uh, vehicles, for the heavy duty vehicles, also for transit buses, for example, could be operating. So I use those kind of um, the, 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 the requirements and then try to develop the, the power converter based on my own idea, different from the, what uh, was the, the commercial is available for the fast charging station with that requirement, and then try to uh, establish the, the, the common DC bus, as you will see, the common DC bus can, can feed the, the EV batteries, can charge it, and then the battery energy storage could help what is so-called the, the, the vehicle to grid technologies to uh, help the utility grid in terms of the voltage support functionality as well, and then the, the solar as well. So that's kind of bi-directional power system. The one of the in early design of many actually technology suppliers for the fast charging station was that uh, due to the, the capacitor banks at the common DC bus, the capacity obviously there is the there are some fluctuations on the capacitor banks. And then those fluctuations can integrate with the, the, the switching phenomena of the power electronics and then it uh, transforms some of those fluctuations in the form of the disturbances and harmonics. And then uh, what have observed in that time was to, to see easily the, the batteries for the EVs are uh, getting heated. And then obviously the negative consequence is to reduce or undermine the lifetime of the battery for the EVs at the, at the best case. And then how we can also, I did some tests uh, based on the, so here I use the, the advanced uh, two layers control system based on the uh, predictive control systems to damp those kind of harmonics from the, the de-sealing side and also how to optimally share the power among the, for example, 
uh, the take advantage of the power produced by the solar or uh, to achieve the vehicle to grid uh, functionality uh, or technologies to, to support the utility, voltage utility grid. Uh, so uh, that here you will see, for example, the, the details uh, blocks for the uh, predictive controller to uh, first <clears throat> damp those harmonics to detect the harmonics are uh, severe in terms of the uh, pushing towards the unstable margin for the charging station system and also how to optimally uh, share the power among the different sources. So I did also uh, using the, the some real time and controller hardware in the loop to evaluate the fast reaction and effective uh, validations of the, the, the theory based on the uh, Opal RT simulator, as you will see, one was the commercialized controller and one was the, the design controller to uh, to be able to benchmark with the what's already um, available in the commercialized controller for the EV batteries, for example. And then you will see that this is the, the real-time simulations. Uh, you know that for the charging stations, uh, usually we have the uh, constant uh, current charging and then uh, here at the point like 0 0.8 seconds there was a request from the utility uh, emulated to 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 support the uh, voltage from the utility side and then the battery uh, uh, energy storage helps the the ev charging to uh, reduce the, the the current and then we move towards the pulse discharging mode and then the the current which is the, the the blue measurement current actually follows the, the reference current and then the current from 88 amps the the nominal uh, charging the constant charging uh, uh, amps for the the battery uh, went down to like 20 percent and then now is like uh, 68 amps and then uh, the the battery energy storage uh, discharged uh, to lower the the ac grid current to help and the support the, the voltage to avoid the uh, unstable situation, for example, uh, during some sometimes uh, we, we have seen in the, the during the design phases and then the prototyping of that fast charging stations, for example, this was just the one example from ABB, but uh, I, many uh, fast charging or charging station manufacturers or companies have seen the, the same uh, oscillations. Um, and then the interactions between the DC link with the, uh, the, uh, the connected EV batteries. And also uh, if we form it as a microgrid, therefore the, the solar inverter and also the, the battery energy storage system also could challenge those, uh, push those uh, stability margins towards the, uh, the, the severe situations. And then the, the next project I did in the, the New York state was the, there was a request from the many utilities in terms of the, the PV systems. For example, if the PV inverter placed uh, in long distance from the utility side, and then the, the utility, uh, yeah, let me show this, this uh, utility circuit. That's the, the actual circuit I got from the uh, national grid. Uh, upstate New York, and then uh, they were interested to do some r and if the PV, for example, in the level of one megawatt placed seven miles away from the utility circuit breaker, and then they have seen that the unsynchronized opening or closing of the utility circuit breaker while the, the PV uh, plant or PV system are still in the unintentional eye landing, and then it could cause a severe uh, damage to the P power electronics device either the loads or the utility equipment and then uh, reach to the uh, the power shutdown because the, they, they realized that maybe the, uh, the the spikes in particular on the the voltage uh, waveforms after unsynchronized uh, reclosing of the utility circuit breaker could put the whole system in the uh, unstable situation. So then uh, we modeled uh, this, this um, the, the system simplified, obviously the, the utility uh, distribution grids, and then uh, the, just test the two commercialized PV inverter. You will see on the top, one was the 500 kilowatt, another one, one megawatt, and then uh, did the testing with the, the controller developed here and then the, the commercialized controller to see, for example, 
if you can see at the bottom two waveforms on the right, the most left side, you will see in the, some certain area here, we have, uh, yeah, here you see there was for uh, five uh, cycles, I believe the utility circuit breaker, the, the green block you will see is opened and then uh, reclosed in a, uh, with the phase shift with the asynchronous manner. And then you will see on the most right side, the, the PV inverter and also the utility voltage got huge spike. The current spikes are, are is, is expected to be manageable for utilities. But anyway, the, the huge spikes on the PV inverter side and the utility voltage, especially if you are in the long distance from the utility towards the end of the distribution system, the stability concern are quite serious. So this shows that the utilities are unable actually to manage the injections of the large scale PV generations uh, to, to avoid uh, deteriorating the voltage profile. And then it comes to the how we can communicate and send the uh, trip signal or uh, the re uh, open or close the utility breaker and communicate with the PV inverter or PV farms. Uh, what would be the, the, the technologies should be the communication based on the fiber optics Obviously, it shows a huge uh, interest, but the cost is another challenge. So utilities are still are looking for some other uh, uh, the communication protocols to, to send the command signals, for example, uh, when this, this uh, situation uh, happens and then uh, avoid uh, damaging the physical damage of the PV inverters. You know that the PV inverters, there are some capacitor banks. The capacitor banks can easily be exploded if there would be the, the huge uh, voltage sparks, for example. So these are the, the key challenge, especially when it comes to huge integration of the generated uh, power from the large scale winds. So, and then for the, for example, the electric vehicle, I put just the, the I think last month or two months ago, the US Department of Transportation just uh, uh, ranks all the 50 states, uh, 50, 51 states of the US in terms of the leading or enabling or uh, how the uh, efforts eases the, the integration of the EV uh, uh, electric vehicles usage. Uh, the California, for example, was on the top, right? But even uh, the, there was one report last uh, two, I think two years ago, or three years ago, the, they just studied the, the charging stations uh, demands in just in the city of the, the LA. Uh, they just claim that uncontrolled EV charging stations may push the overall system, the Southern Power Grid system to, to achieve in the level of beyond the grid's capacity in Southern California. So uh, the, the current trend shows that by 2030, that was the conclusion of that assessment report. By 2030, in the LA, an energy load for just electric vehicle charging station exceeding, um, I believe it was less than 20%, like 18%, 17% of the entire uh, gen, uh, generation capacity. So we are uh, encouraging to, to achieve, uh, to, to use more and more EV, but obviously we need the more charging stations. And then from the grid or again, from the system uh, perspective, uh, that's also huge. That's the good thing, but there are also some, some challenges. So I have also developed some bidirectional power electronics um, uh, converter for the fast charging stations uh, to, to achieve the, for example, in the range of the battery voltage in the range of 270 up to 430, the charging current average maximum uh, 24 uh, amps. So that, that's the requirement based on the, and the power in terms of kilowatt was just 6.6 uh, .6 kilowatt. And the data are uh, just obtained by uh, public information from the uh, General Motors. And then try to um, use different types of the semiconductor devices if we need to um, go move forward with the high frequency, then the, the, the wide band gap semiconductors uh, should be used and then achieve the battery uh, charging curves, for example what it, it would be uh, expected at least for the large scale uh, fast charging developments. And then based on the, what I just explained to you earlier for that uh, the, the experience of heating up the EV batteries 
for one of the, the, the fast charging stations developed a few years ago by the, the, one of the manufacturers. Then I did uh, a little bit uh, research uh, in terms of the, how we can get uh, best control the de-sealing uh, for, for the output of the, the EV battery power converters. And then uh, to uh, do more research, for example, what would be the, 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 the consequence of the oscillations from the DC link to the to achieve to the to the AC current as well. So the uh, some oscillations could also transfer if that's the bidirectional, which it is expected to be in the future. The oscillations could move forward towards the utility grid, and then the AC current also can uh, get uh, some some. Uh, oscillations you will see uh, on the top the blue is just the oscillations happen in for example phase a from the utility ac current and then we need some uh, stability uh, tools or theory or control design can help us to to for example uh, activate the stability loop when the system just uh, reaches towards the the unstable region uh, region and then we can, for example, at the bottom, you see with the stability loop activation, we can damp those oscillations and then try to keep the, uh, for example, AC current from the utility grid uh, oscillations, uh, at least or variations within the quite sinusoidal waveform as it is intended. And then you will see vice versa by interactions from the EV battery, from the solar, uh, at the, the other side of the microgrid system towards the, the charging stations, then the DC voltage, you will see, it's just uh, exponentially increased. And then we need some stable or stability uh, schemes to be able to damp and smooth up those kind of oscillations to the certain level to avoid the, the, the honest uh, instability. And then uh, for the solar wind charging stations, as I said, that the control, advanced control solutions are quite uh, the, the, the demanding and, and uh, effective. Uh, for example, we, we have some leverages to do some advanced control developments to damp those oscillations without placing an expensive or um, spacious uh, filters, in particular, the passive filters to damp the, the harmonics. And then, we can also use the, the learning-based supervisory control algorithms taking advantage of the machine learnings uh, because those kind of machine learnings or data analytics technologies helps to measure a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, <clears throat> data measurements and then to send the command signals quite uh, rapidly. And then for the advanced control systems, definitely when it comes to the implementation, the computational burden uh, is, is the, the huge thing. And then um, I, this study I did shows that the, using the, the machine learning based controller uh, solutions can also achieve the computational burden within the, the requirements. And then you can send the, the command signal to the, the section, uh, the intended uh, or the, the, the section of interest to get that command so fast. Uh, so, and then even for the, the motor drive application, which obviously that's the power electronics, we are moving to the integration of the, uh, the, the drive technologies. For example, that's the, the one of the Rockwell automation and then towards the electric motors, for example, for the, the EV uh, power trains. And then you will see, for example, this is the, the uh, real picture from the Siemens 60 kilowatt electric vehicle traction drive. And then when you open the cover, the section enclosed by the red circle shows the, the exposing drive electronics. So the, even the electric motor and the electronics and the control systems are, um, are, are uh, trying to, to be integrated more and more. And then the compact design, as I said, that the manufacturing, 3D manufacturing, additive manufacturing should help the power electronics uh, the area to achieve the compact design uh, for the electric vehicles. And then I did some uh, stability concern for the, the another uh, power grids, but for the, the, the uh, commercial aircrafts, what is so-called the more electric aircraft is to remove the hydro, uh, hydraulic pneumatic equipment and then put on more and more again power converters. So uh, I did some, you know that for the, the power system of the airplanes uh, are working in the high frequency, for example, for the 
uh, Boeing 747 uh, or Airbus uh, 383, they, they use uh, the, the frequency in the range of uh, 400 to 900, 850 hertz. And then the power quality uh, is uh, huge, especially when you uh, integrate more and more power uh, converters into the power grids of the uh, aircraft. Then I developed the power converter to also compensate some harmonics and then to avoid the, the stability uh, instability for the, the aircraft as well. So did some also, uh, I have uh, performed some uh, earlier the, the experiments uh, using the emulating or simulation of the uh, Boeing 747, for example. And then the, another uh, application could be the, the offshore wind farm. Uh, the offshore wind is, is very interesting because the cluster of wind turbine uh, interactions with the, uh, the, the converters placed on the offshore and also in other converters to convert the DC to AC, compatible AC grid on the land or shore. These interactions of these three components, even with the cable, is, is quite interesting. And then in North Sea, in Europe, in UK, Germany, in Scandinavian countries, um, some incident happened in China also. Um, so a US also in Northeast in particular is trying, uh, there is a huge potential for the offshore wind. So uh, still we need to, to do the more and more analysis uh, all because of these uh, interactions of the different power electronics equipment. Uh, so for example, this slide just showed one of the, the harmonics or re resonance frequencies happened around the, this was for the, I believe the Europe with the 50 hertz, and then you will see the two resonances are just about the fundamental frequency 50 hertz. One is the high frequency 63, and then below the fundamental frequency. So how to uh, uh, control or uh, predict these kind of frequencies, uh, the, the challenge is that it's not just the low frequency harmonics. It could be in the range of the, uh, the, the kilohertz. So like up to 10 kilohertz. So, uh, getting the observability, good observability uh, within the wide frequency band is another huge as well. Um, so then here, I just uh, use the machine learning based uh, technologies to detect such kind of uh, fast uh, resonances or harmonics. So it seems that anyway, we need to have the, the, a lot of measurements and then the measure uh, machine learning or data analytics techniques can easily detect uh, some uh, cycles or uh, a few seconds, microseconds before uh, the incident, we can do some appropriate uh, disconnections to avoid the total shutdown or huge power outage. Uh, this was happened, this actually a study, as you will see, uh, the perform for the, the wind farm I just explained to you based on the real measurement in the field for the wind uh, power plant in Oklahoma. So, and then the, the future ambition, as I said that, for example, I'm just emphasizing on California, uh, in, in half of the 2019, they reached the 1 million solar rooftop. And then on the top, you see uh, US also among the top five, six countries in terms of the deployment of the EVs, electric vehicles, uh, and so on. But still, uh, we know that there are a couple of challenges. First is the system design analysis, and then how to uh, the, the modify our design processes in the real-time operation, real-time manner. And then we need some tools to do that, some different uh, analysis or synthesis way. And then this kind of uh, the, the, the challenges or uh, items should be incorporated into the, the teaching and into the, the curriculum to uh, actually combine the theoretical work with the, uh, the, the experiential learning. That's the, the, the key, and this is huge. Uh, this is actually the demand uh, from the, the industry as well. So uh, I'll skip this kind of uh, slide. So when it comes to the workforce development, the teaching style, uh, based on the, what I just explained, we are moving towards the multi-domain uh, areas. Therefore, the students should be trained in the multi to gain the multi-domain expertise, and then definitely partnership with the uh, the industries, private sectors, regulatory agencies, and utilities are quite uh, uh, reasonable to, to, to be established. 
uh, and then I'll just uh, end my talk with this uh, slide. Uh, this is for 2004, and then the, the National Academy of Engineers, uh, Engineering in 2004, what they expected in that time by 2020, the engineer of the 2020 should be exactly what I highlighted, the, the blue content, the computer-based design, and then the students should actually uh, gain the, the skill set in terms of the large scale network devices and then system perspective, right? But now we know that even we should move forward from system engineering to the uh, system integration. So that's the, the huge challenge when it comes to the renewable based energy from the grid side and also the electrified transportation. So with that, um, I will just try to wrap up my, my uh, talk. So I would be glad to, to interact with you in case of uh, questions. Thank you, Professor Nadimi. That was fantastic. Um, I personally learned a lot. Um, we, if anybody has questions, go ahead and type them into the Q&A and we have about four minutes. Um, thank you again for that wonderful presentation. Um, we are so lucky to have you on the New Mexico Smart Grid Center team. Um, let's see, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I, I actually have one. Um, yeah. What do you feel the skill, what is the most important skill besides the, the systems approach for an engineer of the future to have um, to succeed academically and professionally, um, whether that's a soft skill or, or like, just a, like hardware and loop, loop knowledge. What what is that? Yeah. Skill? Regardless whether we more focus on the the, the software, the, the program development, and also to gain hands-on experience on the lab or experiential learning, the both requires the multidisciplinary or multi-domain skill sets for the students. And for that one, for me to be as a, to be uh, working in in academia, is that. Uh, for example, the, the senior design, capstone design projects, the PhD thesis, master thesis, it's good to actually uh, to, to work on those kind of research projects and the teachings in the teamwork manner. So uh, for these kind of skills, definitely the, the computer science student should interact with the power, for example, electrical engineering, power engineering, power electronics, power system students to learn more. And then for me, as a power electronics person, I need to gain more knowledge or information about the, the wireless communication techniques, information uh, technologies. Uh, so it means that we ourselves should also interact more and more to each other. So that's the, because this is not this one skill fits everyone, right? So the, the, therefore, the, the teaching and the performing the research should be conducted in the way to also bring multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary expertise into the, the, the classes. For example, what I do based on my experience in industry, usually for the courses, I assign the final project. The final project basically is just one very a small segment of the, the real applications and then ask students to do the theoretical analysis and then do the simulations, try to validate those simulations and then see, for example, the effects of changing that parameters. For example, that was exactly the root cause for the incident happened, for example, in the wind farm, some part of the world. So in this way also, it's a good thing for the students to be more motivated because sometimes there's some curriculum are more uh, pure mass or complicated or is, is not something encouraging or, or pleasant for students. But if they recognize that they have to gain this knowledge, that's something they need by the end of their graduation to get a really good job or to advance to the, from the undergrad to graduate, from master to PhD, whatever they would decide to do that, is to uh, also this, this, this concept, this tool, this the simulation tool, this modeling uh, approach is something I have to gain because perfectly that's the demand in the future. And then they can enhance their uh, strengths and then uh, in shining their CVs by gaining those kind of skill sets. But for me, 
uh, as a person to offering the course also uh, in some aspect i have to change the way uh, i used to talk uh, to teach or uh, for example i learned in the past as well so we need to also be more up to date to to see what's going on on the uh, industry sector because some of the challenges also still are kind of struggling for for industry sector that's why the partnership and uh, establishing some job, uh, summer jobs internships is is quite uh, interesting for the both academia and also the industry to include and engage more and more students into the programs we have just one question that i want to get to even though we're right at time yeah. Um, and I think you partially answered it already, but um, I'm going to ask it. And if you give us a quick response, that would be great. Um, Selena, Dr. Connolly wants to know, what are you doing at NMSU to engage your students in the kind of training you described? Yeah, for example, for me, all the course assignments are based on the, as much as I can, based on the real application or real challenges, or at least I can simulate those challenges to be more uh, appropriate with the homeworks. And then the, the thesis for the students and then final project. So uh, the final project is more or less at least they can do some simulations level because they can uh, digest or comprehend the theory by doing the simulation, uh, validate their design. And then at this simultaneously, they can also learn working with the new tool, simulation tools. And then the simulation tools, I usually encourage the students uh, could be those ones are uh, widely used in industry. Awesome, that is an outstanding approach, and I hope that more professors take it take it on because that is what we need. Yeah. Um, thank you. I want to say before we sign off, I want to say thank you so much for your time um, and your talk. We are awesome. super excited to have you, and um, this will be available on YouTube uh, once we get it transcribed, so everybody knows. Um, and the last thing I want to say is I want to plug the, the May webinar, which is uh, with Rusty Nail, and he will be doing Opal RT for beginners. But once again, before we sign off, thank you, Dr. Um, Hamid Nadimi, and have a wonderful day, everybody. I hope. Thank you very much, everyone. But you can always ask questions in case of any uh, unclear point or comments. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.